Hello and welcome back to the IET Bookshelf with me, Mark Reynard, and thank you for joining us again today. In today's episode, we'll be speaking with Rowan Hooper about his book, How to Spend a Trillion Dollars. It's such a compelling thought experiment with real world applications. Now, Rowan is podcast editor of New Scientist magazine, where he spent almost 15 years writing and broadcasting all about all aspects of science. He's got a PhD in evolutionary biology and worked as a biologist in Japan for five years before joining the Japan Times in Tokyo. And later he took up a fellowship at Trinity College Dublin. His work has appeared in The Economist, The Guardian, Wired, The Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post. So remember to stick around after this main segment as Rowan will be back for a live Q&A session where you and the audience can ask Rowan the questions you want to find out more about. Rowan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on IET Bookshelf. Hey, great to be here. Now, look, before we get started and dig a little deeper into the book, which is a great read, it honestly is. But, but first, I wanted to ask, what's it like working as podcast editor for the hugely popular New Scientist magazine? I mean, especially in, in these current times as well, when dealing with a pandemic. Yeah, oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been crazy times. But um, I mean, what gets me through it um, is is just the nature of science. Every week, there's something new to report. Um, so on the podcast, we do, we obviously will cover COVID all the time, uh, and we cover climate change all the time. Um, but there's so much else going on in the world of science that you never really get bored or jaded. You know, there's something new happening all the time. And that's been the fantastic thing about uh, working as a journalist in, in science, actually, uh, throughout my career. And do you think that, that, that science has kind of um, sort of had its game, not, not just its game, but it's sort of what people's perception of science has really sort of upped since the pandemic? It's, it's kind of brought it to the yeah. forefront more, hasn't it? Yeah, it totally has. Yeah, it really has. People are very much relying on it and they understand it very clearly. And, and you can see very well how the look at the vaccine, vaccine development. Everyone knows now, normally it's taken 10 years to get a vaccine from development to out on the streets and now it's taken you know it took a, less than a year or something so and people are aware now of the incredible science that's gone in behind all of that and the rollout so yeah people i think very much on the side now you mentioned that the book sort of balloons um from an article that you were writing originally for the magazine yeah so what was the process of that and and, and what what did you originally sort of plan to include <laughs> well originally i thought it was literally a thought experiment, as you say, and it was more like a bit of fun. What could you do? So I thought of originally was thinking of things like interstellar transport and what sort of starships can we create? And, you know, could you make a, a space elevator, which lots of people talk about as a good way of getting into low Earth orbit. Um, so it had it had kind of wild things like that in it. Um, and also life extension. How could you um, put money into, you know, the, the Silicon Valley dream of living forever? What could you do if you poured huge amounts of money into that uh, and, and genetically engineer humans? <laughs> you know, so it was originally it was a it was a kind of wild sci fi sort of adventure. Um, but I pared it right down to make it things that were actually doable. Right. So um, all those things are fun. Um, a lot of them are, are completely unethical. So I got rid of the things that are just not possible to do, right? And then looked at what you could physically and uh, technically achieve um, without having to wait years for technology to come along and catch us up. So, so yeah, and then, and then I pared my list down to 10 mega projects of different things we could do if you have that sum of money to spend. 
And when you, you mentioned that you took some time off and you immersed yourself in it. Yeah. Um, how long did it take from sort of deciding you were going to do it, take the time off to, to finish in the book? And then what about all the kind of rewrites? Were editors involved? Were they sending yeah. it back? Was it hard work? Well, I mean, it, it's hard work, but uh, especially then in the middle of it, you get a pandemic rolled out across the world, you know, and that throws everything into absolute chaos. Not to mention it changes the, it affects lots of things in the book. You know, I'm writing about global health a lot in the book, and suddenly there's the biggest global health problem that the world's had for, you know, a generation. So, you know, oh, I better rewrite that rather rapidly. Um, but yeah, it, it basically takes, um, I'd say, a year to to write it, um, and then another year of um, of tweaking it, editing it, and getting it getting it put through all the the changes that need to be done, and, the, and when it gets rolled out into into pre-press so a couple of years basically so it's, it, it is a long long sort of thing to do isn't it it's part, part of and and, and you know, so let's get into the book a little bit now yeah. it's interesting that that, 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 uh, uh, that you take an example of the film that many of us know brewster's millions to set yeah. kind of the parameters of the book yeah. so why did you do that and, and what what made you decide to follow those kind of rules yeah well i mean i just wanted to make it really based in in science right so if so for the rules of the book i decided okay you have a trillion dollars what would you spend it on but i didn't and, and want it just 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 for everybody out there a trillion dollars mm. uh, what a are we talking a million dollars a thousand million because because it all a gets a bit comp a thousand billion yeah yeah so so for reference you know apple computer is worth i, I think two trillion um, Jeff Bezos is worth, and, and Elon Musk are worth just over 200 billion. Um, so, you know, yeah, but a trillion dollars is, is 1%, roughly 1% of world GDP. Wow. Okay. So you took those parameters and you said, we're going to use that for this trillion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea was, so in Brewster's millions, he, um, the, the character, Richard Pryor's character has to spend $30 million dollars in 30 days in order to win 300 million. Um, and, and he's told, okay, you, you have to spend it, but you're not allowed any assets at the end. So for my parameters, you also have to spend the money but, and you're not allowed any assets at the end, but you're also not allowed to spend it on a military project. You're not allowed to spend it on a, a political or a media project or a, or a sort of financial asset, you know, gain or manipulation thing. It's all got to be rolled out on humanitarian, environmental or science projects things that are doable now that we can do to improve science or improve the environment or the or human suffering uh, alleviate human suffering those are those are my rules and what made you decide to put those rules around it was it was there something that made you think okay let's not was it to make it more difficult no uh, actually not it was to make it more manageable because <laughs> you know like i said i didn't want it to become a sci-fi book actually i wanted this to be really really things that are doable um and as i as it started off as this thought experiment and obviously i don't have that money but the money is there that's the weird thing you know um and so i wanted to show what you could do if we put our minds to it and if we managed to free up some money that's out there um so it, it actually became quite a serious a make, making a serious point out of what started off as a fun game you know so I wanted to make sure that all the things I was going to talk about and describe and show how we could fund and do these things, they were very much very doable things that were going to change the world in a positive way. And, and you, you've got some price breakdowns at the end of each chapter. And, and I mean, for instance, the US federal government, I think, spends about 1.2 trillion on healthcare every year. And you calculate that it only costs about 860 billion to eradicate numerous diseases, yeah. heart disease, neurological diseases, cancers, all sorts of stuff and extend our healthy lifespan by lots of years. Yeah. So is the US government and lots of governments around the world just really bad at spending money effectively? Or, or is, is, is your dream kind of just a dream, you know? Well, I mean, the thing is that um, what I think, I, I spoke to lots of people about how to improve the global health. And it turns out what you really need to do rather than sort of try to chuck money in at the top and, and tackle big diseases, you, you need to put it in at the bottom and start and give and roll out a universal health care scheme everywhere right and that's the only way you're going to really improve global health um i mean jeremy farrar uh, the head of the wellcome trust 
Um, he's he's really well known scientist these days because of all his work and uh, uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, he gave the example of this is the only way that you're going to um, sustainably improve global health is to is to make universal health care. But that's obviously, like you say, that it's going to cost a huge amount of money. So how do you go about doing it? And what I decided to do was pick one country and and see if you could kind of give that country a universal healthcare system um, with part of the money and see what would happen. And that use that as a flagship to demonstrate the, the incredible um, health changes, improvements you could work in that country. But it's not only that, this is the thing. Um, it doesn't just improve people's health, it saves you money. So if people want to um, say, well, we don't, people have to work out their own healthcare, this is going to save the government money, and that's what other people. Some people might think that's a better metric. Um, so you can you can do both things, and that, so the key point is it it really does save money in the long run, uh, and not in that long a run either. Um, so it's really worth doing from an investment point of view. Uh, and why don't you think that, that that governments are doing it then? Is it just that? Is it because to flip sort of the whole model would be a difficult and and time and time consuming, and and governments generally don't have that time. Or, or what's stopping them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I I don't know. I mean, you know, lots of countries do have universal health care. We have it in the UK, um, but there's lots of problems with our one. And other countries don't have it at all, and there's lots of problems um, even attempting to get the sorts of health care they they have. So um, it's a massive political thorny problem. Uh, I don't know why everyone doesn't do it, but um, this is the this is kind of one of the points to demonstrate that it is worth doing. It's certainly worth looking at. Now, throughout the book, you've got you criticise many billionaires, you know, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and their proposals for, for resolving lots of big issues. Um, but ha have you sent them a copy of the book? Is, yeah. is there is <laughs> have you heard back from them? Have I you ha given actually them have. Yeah. Um, so I did send a copy of the, the book to Elon Musk and, uh, and he said he would read it. He said he'd read it. Um, and uh, actually, it's funny because the, the first chapter has a picture of Jeff Bezos in it. And, um, and, and that I think that upset Elon Musk a little bit because, you know, they're huge rivals. And he was like, that's the book with Bezos in, isn't it? And like, yeah, I should have really put one of him in if I wanted uh, to get a blurb from Elon Musk. But, but anyway, what was really, really interesting about that was um, a couple of months after Elon had read my book, he announced a plan that I... I actually outline in chapter seven of the book and I propose. So as you say, at the end of each chapter, there's thing that I break it down of how you would, how I would spend the money. And then there's a chapter on carbon drawdown. Um, and I look at all the different ways you could get carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is something that many billionaires are interested in. Um, Bill Gates has put a lot of money into it. And, it, and one of my proposals is to start a competition for carbon capture and storage. Um, and by direct air capture. This is when you build, you know, build a machine that will suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and, and fix it down. And at the moment, it's it, it, we can do it, but it's quite slow and expensive. So I proposed a competition, a, a lucrative competition, give $100 million to the first person who can do this at scale to a decent, a, a decent price. And lo and behold, after he'd read my book, Elon Musk actually launched that competition for the same hundred million dollar prize so you know i like to say i've spent a hundred million dollars of elon musk's money which is which is really cool there's, there's a tiny fraction of the money he's got wow. <laughs> yeah it is but a hundred million dollars wow oh, yeah absolutely and and you know so one of the things that comes out of that then is that you know we, we, it's not just government now that we need to persuade to do these things is it it's it's these entrepreneurs these individuals who've got huge yeah. you know reserves of cash we need yeah. to get them involved and, and presumably reading the book and actually thinking about it more yeah i mean it's a really interesting point as to i mean i actually don't think we need we should have to we shouldn't have to rely on billionaires to bail us out of, of these problems right um but the fact is there are billionaires around and a lot of them are looking around for sort of legacy things they can invest their money in to make them make themselves look better or or some in some cases genuinely they want to try to do something really meaningful with their money um and if they want to do some of the things in the book that's fantastic um but actually 
to do the big problems to to solve the biodiversity crisis to solve climate change to you know improve global health and all the other things in the book um these are things that can't be solved by yeah, even Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and the and the Bill Gates of the world, you know, these need state level intervention and spending because they're on a, a level um, beyond, um, you know, even the richest billionaires in the world. Now, now in the book, you, you know, we've, we've just talked there about, you know, sort of climate, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide and taking it directly out of the atmosphere and those kind of things. But yeah. what other strategies do you think would be most successful in combating climate change? Yeah, I mean, climate change is, as you know, a massive problem. What is it? Um, Timothy Morton, the philosopher, calls it a hyper object because it, climate change is such a huge problem. It's hard for us to get our heads around. It affects us in so many ways throughout time and space. But so to, to try and tackle it, I break it down into several different chapters and look at them in turn. So there's agriculture, there's um, energy, the energy sector trans transitioning us to, to net zero. Um, and there's carbon drawdown and biodiversity. So, so try to look at them all in turn. Um, and I think one of the most effective things you can do is to look at the biodiversity crisis um, and to restore and uh, regenerate broken down ecosystems that would draw down carbon and help the biodiversity crisis by restoring ecosystems. So by doing that, you basically get two for the price of one, right? You get two of the big problems in the book started to be tackled um so you get carbon out of the atmosphere and you really start to restore the lost biodiversity around the world um so there's i talk a lot about that in, in some, some of the chapters in the book how to best go about restoring um, global ecosystems marine and terrestrial ecosystems um and to draw down carbon and actually what's really interesting as well is jeff bezos established the earth fund with 10 billion dollars of his money and what they're starting to do now is to put money into air, into areas, like I say, that are particularly at risk from the biodiversity crash, but also are very important carbon stores. So they're doing the same thing. They're looking, they're picking out areas in the world. And these are the first places we need to really protect and restore that are rich in biodiversity and rich in carbon. Now, now, you talk as well about, about the world should turn vegan and that you mentioned many harmful impacts of agriculture and soil yeah. degradation, monoculture, yeah. nitrous oxide, you know, nitrous monoxide yeah. uh, and, and all sorts of and water consumption is a huge one as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what should we be eating? And, uh, you know, and, 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 and is it as drastic as we should all turn vegan sort of overnight or is there sort of scales of that? Yeah, of course, there's scales of it. I mean, I, I say that, that that chapter's called Turn the World Vegan, um, which is a little bit provocative, perhaps. But um, I mean, all, what's really interesting, though, is all the research shows that um, if you do sort of Vegan Monday or, you know, one of these vegan January or vegan before 6 p.m., you know, there's that thing. All you need to do is cut down a little bit on the meat and animal products that you have, and it actually makes a huge difference. Um, so you need to switch out, basically. And I think that was how start to, to get people just cutting down the amount of, of, of meat and animal products that they consume. Um, but it's also, this is really a really tricky one. No one likes to be told what, what they can and can't eat, right? They really, really does rile people. And I understand that. Um, but, but the thing is, it actually has to be done. It's such a critical problem. Um, you know, I think there's a stat in the in the book that if you take cows, cattle, all the cattle in the world as an entity, they account for um, they they would be the third biggest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases after the US and China, just cows, and and so they're a massive problem for climate change, but also for biodiversity because so much land is cleared, forests are cleared to ranch the cows on and to grow soybeans then to feed the cows, that um, it, it's just it's really not sustainable. So you have to do something about it. So that, yeah, spend a chapter talking about what, what can you do to, to slowly change this thing and, and get people to understand that this is really a really critical thing that you can do and that we, we really must do. And there's been, I mean, this is a kind of whole aside, but there's been loads of sort of stuff in the press and recently um, people, so the BBC did a thing on it, um, on 3D printed sort of meat lookalikes and taster -alikes. Yeah, yeah. Have you had a go on any, you know, a taste of any of this and, and what's it like? And is that something that actually would help in the future? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, actually, I haven't eaten the proper meat one. So this is when you get, like you say, the 3D printed, like they use actual um, meat, uh, like animal cells and grow them up in a lab to make a burger out of it. Like those are still really expensive. So I haven't had one of those yet. Uh, although shrimps uh, are much easier to do and they're being they're being now sold in in Singapore um, and some restaurants in the in the Far East, um, in East Asia. Um, and so basically, I just also as an aside, uh, to make to make shrimp meat is much easier to grow in the lab than it is to make a steak, which has a lots of really complex different cells and cell structures in it. But if you want to make shrimp meat, which is used in lots of different Asian cooking, uh, that's quite easy to grow and you can grow that up. Um, and it, and it, it tastes the same. It is the same. It's, it's literally shrimp meat, but it's been grown in a lab rather than been farmed in an incredibly damaging, you know, Vietnamese, um, you know, shrimp farm that's destroyed a, a load of mango, uh, mangrove to, to grow it. And it's also really polluting. So in short, I haven't tried lab grown meat, but I do eat a lot of uh, plant based meat. This is the other sort of thing that's um, that's around a lot at the moment, like burgers that sort of ooze blood when you squeak, when you cook them and they really take, they have this very burgerish taste to them. Um, I mean, I think they're amazing. Uh, and I, I actually don't see why people don't eat those when, when you can. Yeah, as, 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 a, as a northerner, you know, you want, one would think I wouldn't, but I, I, we, 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 as a family, we've started with getting into the kind of the meat-free burgers and, yeah. and all sorts of other things. And, and the chicken burgers, you, can't, you can hardly tell the difference. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the thing. It's, uh, the, these sort of things will help people uh, take them on the path just to cutting down, and that's really what you need to do. Absolutely. So, um, you know, let's move on a little bit now. So um, if you were to spend, you know, if, if I was going to undertake spending a trillion for the greater good, um, and would how, how do I do that, but not sort of through my own, um, my own views? How, how would you do it without a, a, an unconscious bias, so to speak? How would yeah. I get it? How can I avoid that? Well, that's a great question. And the way I try to do it is literally just talk to as many people as I could. Um, and, and, um, and and get be guided by them if and if if you're doing it in if you're spending the money for example in biodiversity or or in agriculture right the key thing there is that you've got to you can't i mean this is the uh, uh, one of the criticisms of billionaires is that they just r run around throw the money at what they want to do um and, and 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 really to hell with the rest of them but what i've tried to do in the book is is look at how you talk to people for example farm owners right farmers and landowners um if you're going to buy a huge amount of land and uh protect it or restore it then actually that land is probably used by people either indigenous people or or landowners or farmers right they've got to be compensated you can't just buy the land and kick them off it and say right that's your lot because then those people won't have any income so you've got to take that into account and so to do that i've looked at projects where that's worked. There's a great project in Cambodia where huge amounts of uh, land has been used, uh, been turned into a, a protected area that tourists now can come and, and see, and you can see all the animals there. Um, but the local people who used to farm the land, uh, now they get money, they get income. So it works. You, so you have to have systems that work for um, to get income for the local people. It's, it's starting to be rolled out in the UK now as well. People are looking at paying farmers instead of to farm the land uh very which is heavily subsidized and you know sheep farming or something and instead of farming that land use it to regenerate the uh, the local ecosystem and then pay the farmers a carbon um a carbon price for the the carbon they're drawing down and that might be more profitable for the farmer than uh than trying to eke out a subsidized you know way of farming um, and it's also loads better for the environment. So, it, you know, these projects have to be win-win for the people who, who are there and for whatever pro problem you're trying to solve. So to go back to answering your question, the answer is talk to local people and work with them to find out what they want to do. So this is the other thing about in chapter one, giving the money away. Um, it's like when people have given money away before, um, you the best way to do it, it turns out is to give the money literally give money to people rather than give them a, a water pump or give them a you know something in their village people know how to spend the money they know what they need so you give them the money and they they will spend it responsibly for what they they know best what to do with it 
But, but, but isn't one of the big issues with humanity is that you either have kind of dictators who could be an entrepreneur or could be a, a state sponsored dictator and they're making the decisions or you have government for the people, which effectively is a committee, but then nothing gets done. So, yeah. you know, how do we get around committee led sort of sort of approaches where everybody's involved and you're asking the local people and but then it just gets slowed down and slowed down and nothing ever really happens? <laughs> Yeah, I wish I knew. Um, the, the book is is more like let's spend this money rather than let's uh, sort out local local government and uh, and central government. Um, so yeah, but it's a it's, it is an important problem. Um, I mean, in a, in a way, part of the reason for writing the book is a frustration with what you're saying about nothing gets done. It's about supposing I had this money and I could just dump it onto projects and cut out all that stuff that you're talking about. Um, and the hope is that it might start to show, well, let's actually make, you know, free up some of these problems that we're trying to struggle with in, in getting things done and in getting cutting through that red tape. So that, that's the hope. Now, now that you state in the book, and it's an amazing fact, that the UN only spent, was it, 3.1 billion on global warming? Yeah. And yet in 2020, spent between 9 and 12 trillion on, on their response to the coronavirus crisis. So how do we persuade governments that they can find that money to solve these issues quickly? Yeah. And, and is it time for the UN to really step up? Well, the UN steps up as much as it can. But as you say, it doesn't have the financial clout, you know, um, and that's that's the problem for, for as far as it's concerned. Uh, it can only make these recommendations. It can get everyone together like we've just seen in Glasgow, you know, at the climate change talks. Uh, it can get everyone together and say, right, you guys, you've got to sign this thing. You've got to step up. Um, but it can only do so much because it doesn't have that much muscle, really. It has persuasive power, uh, it has organizational power, but it, it can't force uh, anyone's hand. So, um, yeah, it's, that's the best we can do. That is the best we're in at the moment. So that's why it's been going so slowly, because you've got to sort of get everyone on board and make them agree to putting coal and fossil fuels on the onto the climate pact for the first time ever um and you know are we going to phase out um coal coal use or are we going to phase down it eventually be was that's how it was used in the end we, we have to phase down rather than phase out so it's very incremental um but yeah again this is kind of part of the reason for writing this to try to express from frustration with the slow pace of change that we've got whereas we have this potential to do such incredible things, but everything happens so slowly. Now, now, you know, do you think it's time now really for engineers and scientists to really kind of sort of step up and, and fast track at least some of the solutions that you're talking about in your book? And, and, and do you think that something like COP26 is enough? Or, or do you think it's really you know, the, the global engineering and science community that are going to find the solutions? Well, this is the thing, right? The solutions are found. Uh, like well, everything in the book and i talk about everything from you know exploring the outer moons of the solar system to solving climate change and solving global health and poverty right all of these things we know how to do them that's the thing that's the kind of point um and it's not that we have to wait for scientists and engineers to step up they they're ready to go they need funding to get their projects off the ground or to scale it up more Right. So that we're already, we're, you know, everyone's got the bit between their teeth desperate to do it. We're just these are all these things that I talk about are being hampered by lack of funding and lack of ability to go forward. So um, and all they need is is to get take the brakes off, you know, and let, let's get this going. So, yeah, I, they're, they're there. We're ready to go. So. If you could, and, and there was just a couple of things that you could say to me and, and, and the people watching, what, what would you suggest we did now to work towards that bigger picture of building this kind of better world that we could all live in? Um, what, you mean if I, if I had this money to spend? Well, just, just for me then. I mean, if, if you yeah. would just say to me, Mark, right, yeah, come on now, there's two things here. You can do this you know, without any money. And then, and then if you had a bit of money, how would you persuade me? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, the first thing I think is you've just got to talk to people about the problems that are in the world and, and, and make people more aware of the things we can do. I don't want I don't want to make everyone think I have to 
I have to stop flying as much. I have to give up meat and give up whatever, you know, carbon intensive products. Um, that is something we do need to do, but it's not down to all of us, right? It's down to the, it's down to governments and big industry to change the way they work as well. Right. So I don't want it to be turned, given to everyone, everyone's problem for, to save the world, to be my individual choices. It's not just that it's like, we've got to change the way that the way the, the global system works as well. So you need to make your voice heard. And that means talking to people, talking to, uh, you know, your representatives and just trying to get the word out that we really have to change and, and that you're willing to change and you have, you'll support people who are also willing to do that. So that's what I would say as at an individual level, we, we, we need to do. As well as that, you, 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 you mentioned, you, well, I think you've got, you got daughters. How, how many daughters yeah. have you got? Two, 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 two daughters. I'm in one's bedroom now. Yeah. And how, how old are they at the moment? They're four and nine. Four and nine. So, and you, so do they know about the book? Are they proud of, of you and its success? um well my daughter did have my older one did have the books in her on her shelf which i was really pleased about but just recently she's chucked them out so she's got no room for them anymore <laughs> so um i think they're you know a bit young at the moment actually my daughter does keep asking me to write a children's book rather than one of these boring science books you know well maybe maybe you could do a science book for kids that'd be fantastic yeah, you know. yeah that would be there good. we go and if you do I'll, you know it came from here first but um so and, and do, do they have a, a grip on 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 the global issues that you're talking about though and i mean do you see it through their eyes sometimes as well i mean i've got a five-year-old and they come back from school and you know and, and we try and get involved as well at home but yeah you know they are much more aware of things now than than perhaps we were when we were five six seven eight nine yeah i mean they they are aware of um, climate change and COVID, especially, you know, because mm. their lives have been changed by COVID completely, you know, being off school. And so they, they understand that a little bit. I don't think they get the global impact of COVID at all. Um, and they do know very much about climate change because they talk about school all the time. Um, the, the kids have a like a green counsellor that's elected from um, each year group that has to talk to the teachers about how they the school can address um uh, you know climate issues and and get towards net zero um so they're very aware of that and it's really it's a fine line to to walk between um you know terrifying them about the future um and the present with with covid and with you know they see the news with their climate issues all the time um and and the necessity to to really get involved and do, and, and and help change things so yeah they're, they're very aware of it which is yeah it's kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? It is. I mean, you, you talked there about their awareness of kind of the COVID, you know, just their understanding of, of masks and what that can help with, understand about washing hands, all of those things for a five-year-old. I mean, you've got a five-year-old as well. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal, really, because, you know, if you think back two, three years, um, children were coming home. With, I mean, certainly when they're five, I, I'm sure you get this well. They're constant colds, constant bugs, constantly passing it on to. But you know, I've had far less of that because they're yeah. washing their hands all the time. They're not yeah. rubbing their hands on their nose. Yeah. They just have this awareness, which is incredible, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, well, exactly. Well, well, let's just hope they can keep some sort of awareness throughout their lives. I mean, um, and and turn it into a good thing, you know, rather than some horrible thing they've had looming over them or they you know some weight they've had on their shoulders make make good out of it now this book two um so you know the, the question obviously everybody wants to know is is there a book three is it coming out is it going to be the kids book do you think or oh, i don't know i'm i'm working on different ideas at the moment but um nothing's quite there yet um but it's all taking shape yeah Fantastic. So, so we'll watch this space. Well, look, Rowan, absolute pleasure talking to you. I know you're going to sort of come back for the Q&A um, yeah. live with the audience, so that'll be fun. But um, again, just thank you so much for joining us and really appreciate it. No, lovely to chat, Mark. Thanks for having me. Great. Hello and welcome live now with Rowan Hooper, who's joining us live. How fantastic to have you here. Brilliant. Thanks for having me, Mark. And so um, hopefully we've got a, little, a bit of an audience out there going to be sending in some questions. If you have, you can drop the questions into the YouTube chat or send them via the email address. Um, so, Rowan, um, what's been happening since we last saw you? <laughs> uh, well, I've been, um, the book's come out in the US, uh, where it's got a different title, actually, it's called How to Save the World for Just a Trillion Dollars. So they've really brought out the, the, the literal saving the world parts of the book. Um, and, and yeah, it's all about 
reaching out to philanthropists and more billionaires to try and get people to put their hands in their pockets, you know, and make this thing happen. And, and, and have you been out there sort of promoting the book at all? Um, I've done it a bit. Yeah, I've done a few um, conferences and a few talks, but um, yeah, you know, it's been slow getting with with lockdowns and various things going on. You know, it's been a it's been a difficult time for writers, but um, slowly getting there and things like this really help. So. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, we got we got some questions that have been sent in over the last sort of a week or so. So um, just the first one really was um, people are asking sort of how did you get into the new scientist? Did you set about that when you first sort of were, were, were moving into the world of journalism? Was that your yeah. goal? And um, um, was it just a chance you got the job there in the end? Yeah, well, no, I, um, <clears throat> I worked as a science journalist in Japan. Um, so I was a biologist originally. I worked in a, um, a conservation lab in Japan for many years um, and then I started writing while I was still a biologist and then a job came up at a newspaper in Tokyo um, as a science editor so I got that job and I worked as a science editor of that paper for a few years um, and then eventually I moved back to the UK um, and this job at New Scientist came up um, actually the first job I applied for I didn't get at New Scientist but the second one I did get um, and I got a job as a junior reporter and um, it was brilliant because you know, when I worked at the newspaper, it was the science page was just one small section or the science stories were very small and people were much more interested in the foreign news or the domestic news or sports, you know. Um, but then I joined New Scientist where it's all about science and, and technology and medicine and engineering. So, yeah, it was brilliant. I, I kind of found my people. And, and you said that you were a biologist originally. Yeah. So did you always have a love of, of kind of all things science or was, was it more the biology aspects that had always sort of taken your sort of real love for? No, originally it was mm. biology, um, very much so. It was, um, I was interested in, in ecology, that's what I did at university, and animal behaviour and evolutionary biology in particular. Um, but then I guess after a few years working as a scientist, I, I did become more interested in just all sorts of things, you know, planetary science, um, physics stuff, even though I'm not a physicist, you know, it becomes very fascinating stuff going on there. Um, and then as a journalist, I've, I've just become really much a, a jack of all trades and just, and I think that's, that helps with longevity as well, because, you know, you don't get siloed into one thing, you don't burn out, you can always move around and start reporting on different issues from different parts of science. And, and for you, you know, you, you said that you were a biologist uh, uh, originally at university. How did you become a journalist? How did that kind of flip over from being someone working in science to then actually writing and, and, and speaking about it? Yeah, well, for me, it happened. Um, I, I literally just started submitting stories um, when I was when I was a, a, a working scientist. So I, I would just, uh, you know, send off stories to editors um, at the Guardian um, and at the at the Economist um, and at the Japan Times. So that's where I ended up working. Um, and so you slowly start, you know, forming a relationship with editors at different places. They know who you are, um, and then you can slowly start getting stuff out there. And and that's how it that's how it worked for me. So there are different routes into journalism, just oh, like yeah. there are in any in any walks yeah. of life, I suppose, aren't there? Oh yeah. Um, and, um, and and do you prefer sort of um, the audio? I mean, you're a podcast editor now. Yeah. Do you do you do you still do a lot of writing in terms of your day to day, or is podcasts more about you know the ability to sort of suck out information from people you're talking to? Yeah, I do I, a bit of both, really. So I do do some writing still um, for New Scientist and for my own stuff. Um, and but for the podcast you know, that still has to be written. The show gets written. So I write the show and you put the show together. And then there is, like you say, there is that aspect of uh, going out there, meeting scientists and meeting people and then engaging with them and doing a doing the interview. And that's a slightly different skill set, isn't it? Of, 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 of just drawing stuff out of people and, and getting, getting good quotes out of them. And, and going forward, um, have you got any more books coming out? Yeah. Is there anything on the cars? Do we, do, uh, can we talk about anything? Um, we can't talk about it yet because I've, I'm still pottering around with it, really. I'm still working on a few ideas and I haven't settled on what the next one's going to be. But yeah, hopefully soon. 
And, and what's the process for somebody out there who might have never written, you know, an article and sent it into an editor or even you know, thought about writing a book? What would the process be for somebody who wanted to have a go at this? How do you go about it? Well, for a, to write a piece, like a smaller piece, which most people will start off writing a, a story first before you could write a book. Um, I think people have to find, think about what they, what is their unique selling point? What have they got that no one else has got? Because editors are besieged by stories all the time. Um, and, and there's many very experienced journalists out there who are pitching stories. So for, for new people, you've got to think, what have I got? that will stand out, that will make an editor think, oh, hang on, I need to give that person a try. So identify what you've got, what angle you, you've got that's original and that's gonna really appeal to an editor and find that. And it might be as simple as just something new, just find something that no one else has written about, or it might be some experience you've had, but, but find something no one else has got. So, so let's move on now to the past two, two and a bit, half years now, isn't it? Two and a half years of, of global pandemic. And yeah. um, we had a question come in, which is, um, you know, the vaccines, you know, lots and lots of evidence now about how successful they've been. Um, but there's still an awful lot of people who distrust the science. So why, why do you think that is that people are so distrusting of this particular aspects of science? Oh, that's a that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, it's it's got to be something about general distrust with authority at the moment and this post truth world that we're in and people calling fake news about things and and not believing scientists and uh, you know we've it's got to be i think you've got to look to the leadership of and not just the uk but in different countries people look to the leaders what do they do if you look at look at new zealand right that they've had a fantastic response to the pandemic um, and that might, might be a lot to, because the leadership there has been very clear about the benefits of vaccination, the benefits <clears throat> about lockdowns um, and, and there's been a very simple clear message and, and the people have gone with it. Um, but in the US and the UK that's not been so clear and there's been, politics have been played with, with the pandemic um, and so it all gets muddled up and, and then you do get this yeah, you do get anti-vax feeling, anti-mask wearers, um, people who are reluctant, uh, vaccine reluctance. Um, so maybe it is something to do with the, the, the leadership and what people look to. And then there's so much option now, isn't there, to be able to find somebody who's talking how you want to hear in some respect. So that, that amount of media that's out there, you can find an angle yourself, I suppose, and then take yeah. that line and then it builds from there. Yeah, yeah. Now, look, we've got a question as well is Elon Musk. We, we could talk all day about Elon Musk, I'm sure. But he took your ideas on board. Have you yeah. now sent, you know, especially with the publication in the States, have you sent your book to any other billionaires, any other governments, any other big politicians? <laughs> well, um, I, I have. I've, I've tried to get it out there. But the, the thing is with with billionaires is they're they're mostly very well shielded from people like me trying to bug them for money. You know, they get, you can imagine what it's like if you're a billionaire, you know, everyone, everyone who's ever known you will be going, oh, by the way, I've got this great project, chuck me some money, you know, so they have layers and layers and layers of people who, who shield them from that. Um, with Elon Musk, I, I had a straight line to him um, and I got him the book di literally directly um, and it, I emailed it to him and he emailed back to me, um, but I don't have, you know, I don't have that line to jeff bezos unfortunately <clears throat> which um uh, i wish i did i mean i've been talking with um so bezos set up the earth fund um and he put 10 billion dollars of his money into that and that's doing some really interesting stuff and he's appointed a guy um from the world resource institute um to run that for him and i have spoken with this guy so you know it's one removed but um I'm, I'm, I am trying to get to reach out as best I can, but really I've got to hope that it happens organically, that this thing, you know, builds a bit of momentum. People start talking about it and it, and it does come across the desks of, of people with real money and power. And, and, you know, Elon Musk spending an absolute fortune on, on space travel, on getting to Mars. Do you think ethically he should be looking at using that money for other means of, of like perhaps doing more things on earth? Mm. Or do you think the, the sort of the thought of going to Mars is, is a great one? And, and why is he doing that? Why does he want to be on Mars? Well, 
okay, so he wants to go to Mars. His stated aim is because he thinks that we need to be a two planet um, species in case there's a disaster on Earth, like a meteor strike wipes out <laughs> humanity on Earth. So he want, he says he wants to have a, a colony, uh, a settlement on Mars to, as an insurance policy for the human race. Um, and, the, and uh, you know, as you sort of hint at there, what many people say is, well, why don't you just protect Earth a bit better? Because we're in a lot of trouble here. Um, and why don't you do that? Um, but that's not what, you know, he's interested in going to Mars. That's been, it's his absolute dream and goal to go to Mars. And, you know, people can say, well, it's unethical to do that. You should spend your money on whatever, but it's his money. He can basically, he can do what he likes with it. Um, and, you know, maybe it's better doing that than it is buying a fleet of, of super yachts and buying a few islands and rich places around the world to live on you know, or just reinvesting his money and making more pots of money. So, you know, I don't want to, I'm not here to defend him, but, you know, it's his money and, and and that's what he's doing with it. And do you think in our lifetime, or perhaps your lifetime, I don't know how old we both are, but in our lifetimes, um, do you think we'll be seeing Mars, you know, finally getting humans landing on Mars? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I really do. Um, you know, if you look at what he's done with SpaceX, it's absolutely extraordinary uh, in the time. And uh, everyone said it couldn't be done. Uh, they're, they're doing ex amazing things now. He's building the big, biggest rocket that's ever been built, bigger than the, the Saturn V. Um, and, they, you know, they're going to test fly it. That's the one that will go to the moon and go to Mars. Um, I think it's it, it, will, it will happen. On, on his timeline, he thinks it's going to happen within the next few years. And it's probably, that's probably a bit soon. But, you know, it could be by the end of the decade or the mid 2030s, um, we could see people on Mars. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite I'm quite sure that is going to happen. And do you, I mean, you know, in terms of ownership, um, <laughs> do, do, do you think when he lands there, he's going to plant a flag that says this, this, this yeah. planet's now owned by SpaceX me. Corp. Yeah, yeah. SpaceX Corp. And, yeah. and we're going to see something uh, akin to some film where, you know, he colonizes Mars and only his friends get in. Well, um, it won't be only his friends because people will have to pay their way to get on there. He, he has got a, um, a way of, you know, he wants to get million, a million people up to Mars on, on Mars transporters um, to, to settle up there. I mean, yeah, it's going to be if, if his vision comes true, there will be a lot of people going up there. Um, but as to whether he can plant a flower, I mean, he probably he could. He will, I'm sure he will when he gets there. Um, I mean there will be lots of legal implications and there'll be loads of, you know, there are, there are space treaties, there are international treaties that cover um, this sort of thing, but you know, who's going to enforce it? Yeah. You know, if he's up there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, um, you know, we talked then about, you know, individuals having lots of money, governments, uh, you know, have a lot of money, but they've got set amount of budgets for, for different things. Yeah. Where could money be taken from, some projects and really well spent in your opinion now to change i mean especially with the energy poverty and energy crisis we're in at the moment is there ways government could be utilizing money from other funds that they've got to, to help us oh that's that's a tough one i wouldn't like to say where to take money from um because you know all governments are, are kind of over budgeted already aren't they um but I mean, where I think the lowest hanging fruit is to get to get some money, at least if you look in the US, is uncollected taxes. And, and the US Treasury estimates that at seven trillion dollars by the end of the decade. Um, and that's not tax dodging. Right. That's not people who are avoiding tax. That's just uncollected tax. So imagine if the Treasury could get their act together and just go out and get some of this a bit more. Um, we could we could find some of this money and you, then you could do some, you could fund some big projects so um maybe tax is is the best way to to try and find this money yeah it's it's, it's, a, it's a really weird one isn't it there's all this money sort of should have been given should have been collected hasn't been yeah collected it and it's just like ruling out all of the waste in a way isn't it yeah, it's really yeah. efficient yeah you know and getting to that efficiency um so if we were all to do if if, if let's say the whole of britain i don't know had a hundred pounds each to give to somebody which organizations and charities would be the best place to give that money instantly to really make something different happen 
Well, um, it, it would depend on what you wanted. You know, if you were interested in alleviating poverty, um, you might want to give it to um, Give Directly is a, is a great charity where, which as the name implies, it, it literally wires money straight to people. Um, so you get it in your bank, you know, they get it in their bank account and decide how to spend it. And I talk about that in chapter one of the book. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because in the chapter, you talk about the fact that that's not always as scary as it might seem. People say, oh, you can't just give money to people yeah. and they're just going to they're going to blow it on silly things. If you're in yeah. food poverty, you're going to use it wisely, aren't you? Yeah, 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 they do. And, and all the experiments show that they do use it wisely. Um, so that's one. But if you're more interested in, say, um, you know, biodiversity, you might want to give it to a charity that will is looking to um, protect land um, from from degradation or restore land, restore ecosystems, tree planting, or uh, you might want to put it into some renewable company that will help tra speed the transition to renewable energy uh, or to some climate activist group that will help increase the pressure. You know, there's there's lots of different ones to look at, depending on, you know, what your personal thing is. So. We just talked there about fuel poverty, but we're also into so obviously climate problems in the, in the world at the moment. Um, do you think that if you had um, a lot of financial backing at the moment, that the best way to sort of alleviate some of the climate issues we've got is through technical innovation? Or do you think it's better to reduce everybody's carbon footprint a bit by doing more renewables and more things at home? So, Or, or is it a combination of both? Uh, I mean, it's a combination, but actually it's more going to be about... Um, moving to renewables at a big level and it's not about you know individuals putting a windmill on their house or putting a, a solar panels it's not it's it, it can't be down to the individuals this has got to come from a, a government level um on a on a much bigger scale to stop um basically stop prospecting for fossil fuels stop digging up uh, you know certainly stop digging co coal uh, which lots of countries still are doing, you know, building coal-fired power stations, um, but also oil and gas. You know, it's got to stay in the ground to have any hope of, of staying at 1.5 or even 2 degrees. So that sort of thing can only happen at a government level. So, yes, we should be doing our bit individually, and that will help increase the pressure on governments. But to really do the big things, we need government-level action. And, and you know, in the book, you know, a lot of the things we could be doing very quickly if we actually all as a, as a globe got together and pushed them forward. So yeah. rather than working towards them slowly, should the actions that you present in your book um, have already been undertaken, really, in your opinion, if only we had the financial backing, would it make a massive difference? Oh, God, it would make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, ideally, of course, they would have all been done already. Um, you know, you could spend on alleviating poverty, you could spend on, look at the one on, on, on vaccine rollout or pandemic, pandemic preparedness. If the money had been spent on that, then we would have been in a much better position when, when we did have a pandemic crossover. But people, you know, people don't, don't want to spend money on prevention. It, and it's the same with climate change. If we'd have started spending money 20 years ago, when scientists were urging that we did things it would be it would have been much cheaper we could have bent the curve down from co2 emissions much more easily than now now we're in the really really sticky position of having to very rapidly make emissions cuts it's going to be more expensive it's going to be much more difficult it's still we still need to do them but we should have we should have done them all earlier yeah it's, it's amazing been. isn't it i mean yeah. prince charles probably 40 years ago was was a was a huge sort of campaigner for lots and lots of the kind of uh, especially in, in in sort of um, agriculture and and all other areas of that sort of thing and and people sort of ridiculed him to some extent yeah so yeah yeah but scientists as well, you know, not just you know, members of the royal family, but um, many scientists for years have been saying this, you know, for decades. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's time now, I suppose, that, like you said, it's got to be a government approach, though, hasn't it? And, and, and individuals can do so much. Um, we talked we talked a little bit there as well. You know, there's lots of things like your windmills and your, your, your solar panels. Um, how does how does a, a government sort of sort of circle get the circle to actually sort of form properly when you've got expensive sort of new technologies 
and you've also got people who need those the most at the lowest end of the sort of wealth scales mm. but but the two don't always come together and so it seems that a lot of the things that come out electric cars solar all of those things end up on the more wealthy properties and 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 on the roads before the the, the lower end of the scale goes. yeah How can we get that to reverse almost well i mean the government's just going to have to put in some sort of grants um and subsidies for for people so that you know we can all afford to have heat pumps installed into our housing at the moment we are in this early adopter phase where things are always expensive if you're the first first to get it you know it was the first first people to get smartphones that were they were expensive you know um but now everyone's got them so because they the price comes down or it should it should have come down um and the same will happen with other kinds of technology like you know battery cars um electric cars and uh, and heat pumps and and solar panels for residential properties as well so so yeah i mean what you what we need is a bit of government support um so that it, these can be rolled out more widely and I, I think as well as if we can see the savings that are to be had by some of these technologies then paying for them over a longer period of time uh, and can, can have payback especially now that the prices are going up heat yeah, pumps yeah. are really coming into their own aren't they yeah yeah they are now is a fantastic time so i do hope that the government um our government and other governments use this as an opportunity use the you know the russian the, the energy crisis to to start really pushing for renewable rollout much more widely um so you you you've, you've got a uh, you've got an idea for a book coming up i i heard that earlier now just talk us through what the process for you for writing is. I mean, how do you start with, um, you know, you've got a new idea, you want to talk about something that's going on. Yeah. What would you do to actually get for the, for the viewers out there that are listening and think, I want to write this book. I want to, what was the process for you? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I turn over the idea a lot, right, you know, read around it. I hone it as much as, as much as possible. And then, and then you take it to an agent. Um, so there's always this this layer between the writer and the publisher, and that's the agent, uh, the literary agent. They will look at your idea for you and say, "Nah, it's no good. It's boring, uh, or it's it's too, uh, or it's been done." And how big that is that idea? Is that a page? Is that uh, is that half a page? What 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 will that idea look like? Um, yeah, it can. Be. Sometimes it's just a page. It can be just a page. Um, and then the, the agent might say, yeah, that's great. Now go away and write 20,000 words on that or write the first chapter and then write the structure of the rest of the book. Um, and that's generally what you do. Um, and that can be quite, so that's quite a lot of work before you've even sold the book. This is right. This is then you, then you have a really strong proposal. The, the agent then takes that around to different editors in different publishing houses and says, hey, look at this great idea. Here's a sample um, that this, this writer can really deliver. This shows that they can really deliver and have an idea where the book's going. So what do you think? And that's generally how it happens. And do you prefer, do you prefer writing books or do you prefer, I mean, I don't want to get you out of your job here, but do you prefer writing books or do you prefer doing sort of your podcast journalism? Which is the sort of, are they similar in some respects? Yeah, I mean, they are similar because they're all about finding a narrative and finding a compelling way of telling a story um, to other people um, and engaging with scientists, especially and, 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 and finding out about what they're doing. And that's a really fascinating thing. Um, so with the, the New Scientist Weekly podcast, that is a more it's very short form. You know, each each segment is probably only eight minutes long. But so we pack in as much as we can into that eight minutes by talking to scientists, finding out really some really cool stuff. Um, and then obviously with a book, it's long form. So you can really then get into something in much more depth. So, yeah, I like both ways of doing it. <laughs> now, your book, which is behind me here, if there was one bit of this book, so let's say you only had, I don't know, 100 billion, you know, which one thing would you set about to solve? And and. Uh, and why? Uh, I think if I had a hundred billion, I would probably look at, I, I'm, I, I would look at, at biodiversity and carbon storage. Um, and this is what I really like about the, the Earth Fund that Bezos is doing. So they are looking at, at, at buying up areas of land and protecting areas of land that are vital for biodiversity and vital for carbon storage. So you get you get to tackle the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. 
So I would I would put money into that. I'd I'd really like to put money into the Amazon, into projects to save the Amazon because it's in a really bad position at the moment. Very very worrying. And if the Amazon forest tilts and becomes a savanna, you know, and it stops being a tropical forest and that rolls out across the Amazon, then that could have knock on effects globally. Um, not just the the sort of disaster that it would be. Um, for Brazil and for the people there, which it would be a total disaster, but globally it had terrible knock-on effects. So I would look at, uh, if I had 100 billion, I'd definitely put some of that into looking at what we can do to preserve the Amazon. Um, obviously, it, mean, it would mean working with the Bolsonaro government, although they might hopefully get kicked out in the next, in the elections coming up later this year. Um, the other thing is saving the Arctic. Um, and there's, there's, similarly, if the Arctic flips over to to melts completely in the summer, then that will have terrible consequences for the whole northern hemisphere, costing many trillions of dollars. So we we urgently need to look at how what we could do to preserve the to store to refreeze the Arctic. Um, and there's some interesting, really interesting things, but they need money to research it. So I'd definitely put some money into that as well. And uh, and before we have to wrap up, because we're coming to the end of our of our hour, what would be the the one sort of um, fantastically optimistic technologies or, or science things that's going on at the moment that's really making you think we, we're okay we've got some great things coming <laughs> oh i can't think of one i mean that, that this is the great thing about this is what i tried to put in the book there are there are loads of solutions you know there's there's ways of drawing down um carbon just by putting rock dust on the fields right enhanced weathering i talk about that in the book that just by grinding up basalt rock and spreading it on the fields as we grow plants, that will draw down carbon. That can draw down up to maybe up to 50% of the carbon drawdown we need to get to net zero. Um, and that's a fantastic solution right there. We really need to test that. That's one I'd do. Uh, I'd like to look at um, growing um, kelp, growing seagrass around, uh, around our coastlines globally. Um, that could draw down a lot of carbon and create good um, ecosystems for marine life, um, as well as protecting us against sea level rise and storms. You know, Lots of work going on with kelp as well about food sources as well, isn't it? Yeah. So it's like a triple whammy almost. Yeah, yeah, it is. Actually, you're right. Yeah, we, it can help with that agriculture uh, there as well. So um, there's, there's two right there. But um, yeah, I think anything that can that can try to tackle both the biodiversity and the climate crises. And there are loads of solutions. They're all in the book. Um, I would, I am excited about all of those, but we need to roll them out. We've got to get moving on these things. Brilliant. Well, Rowan, look, it's, it's a great read. So if you haven't read it, grab your book. It's available in all good bookshops and online in the, in the usual places. And we'll, we'll fund a bit more space travel and other things yeah. like if we go to the right places. Yeah. Um, but, but, but Rowan, before we go, I just want to mention as well, next episode is Bobby Siegel, who's launching his, his book at the end of May, um, which will be the last in this particular series. Um, but from myself and, and Rowan, thank you so much for coming in at Today Live and talking to us. And when the next book's out, hopefully we'll see you again for that one. Love to. Look, thanks. Great to talk to you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers.